Hello everybody and welcome to the Pulse Pests webinar. My name is Prue Cook and I work with the Birchip Cropping Group and I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities for pulses. Now, before we start Paul's presentation, just some quick housekeeping. We'll take questions after the presentation. You should see a Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. That will allow you to ask questions. If you click the Q&A button, that will open the window. You can type your question, question into the box and hit send. And if you would like to, you can check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to your question. Um, you can also like and comment on other people's questions. If you think someone's asked a particularly good question, feel free to either add to it or like it so we can see which are the most popular questions. If you prefer to ask your question out loud, you should be able to see a raise hand button also at the bottom of your screen. If you click that, I'll turn your sound on you so you can ask Paul directly at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded, so if you can't stay for the whole thing, if you have any technical issues, or you would like to share this, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel next week. Now let's get started. Today's presenter is Paul Umina, the Director of Caesar Australia, and Paul is an accomplished leader in pest management in Australia and is here to give us an overview of what to look out for in our pulse crops this season. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Prue, and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so obviously today we have fairly limited time to talk about pulse pests. Of course, there are a very large number of different invertebrates that we will find in pulse crops, um, and clearly we can't cover them all today. So what we will do is just really focus on a few key groups of pests that we commonly do find in pulse crops in Southern Australia. So the groups that I want to talk about today are the mites, the aphids, and thirdly, helicoverpa, or native budworm, as many of you will know it. And again, we don't have a lot of time today, but what I'll try to do is, is kind of for each of these groups, cover the biology and impact, um, and focus particularly on some of the management options that we have available to us for each of these three groups. In the interest of time, I won't talk a lot about insect identification, but I want to make the point up front that uh, I believe insect identification is paramount to good pest management, not just in pulse crops, but all broadacre crops and pastures. Uh, there are a number of resources and services available to support growers and advisors. Um, we certainly have a free insect identification service that we run here uh, at CESA as part of our GRDC funded pest facts project. Um, I know those services are available in other states as well. And there are also, of course, some really good back pocket guides and new guides that I'm sure many of you will have seen. Here's just a couple that are relevant to the topics and the groups that we will cover today. Um, these two back pocket guides uh, are great little references to aid uh, in-field diagnostics of aphids and mites that we will commonly find, not just in pulse crops, but broader uh, grain crops in the southern region. So that's enough about, I guess, the, the insect identification. As I said, it won't be touched on too much today um, because of time, but I certainly would ensure that I leave you with that, that key message that it is really critical to getting uh, our pest management right. So let's talk about the mites to begin with, and just briefly we'll touch on the biology and life cycle. In pulse crops, as in other broadacre crops in the southern region, we typically find four different pest mites. Our red-legged earth mites, which many of you will, I'm sure, be aware of, blue oak mites, balaustium mites, and the fourth one, the briobia mites, sometimes also referred to as clover mites. Now, the briobia mites this season have certainly been quite topical. Um, the dry, um, autumn period, uh, the mild conditions that we've experienced through autumn and the start of winter have been incredibly conducive to Briobia mites building up. And that is why we are seeing quite a lot of uh, reports and quite a lot of concern about Briobia mites over the last three to four weeks in establishing crops. And this is the mite that you can see circled on your screen. 
each of these four mites do differ in their biologies. So they differ in the plant they attack, they differ in their seasonalities, and they also differ in the way they respond to different chemicals. And I'll touch on a few of these points now. Firstly, in terms of seasonality, most of you may be aware that things like red-legged earth mites and blue oak mites undergo a diapause period, so they're not present over the hot summer months. They typically start to hatch out at about that time when our seedlings are coming out of the ground, so around sort of April, and they go through two or three, uh, sorry, three or four generations during the cropping season, and are typically then, by the end of the year, already back in their diapause stage. Now this strategy, this life cycle differs to balastium mites, which have a more protracted seasonal distribution. And it is certainly quite different to Briobia mites, these mites that we're seeing quite a lot of at the moment. So Briobia mites, as I mentioned, actually prefer warmer, drier conditions. So they are actually present and abundant right through the season, including over summer. And in fact, what we know with Briobia mites is that they dislike very wet and cold conditions. So we know that naturally Briobia mite numbers will decline um, as we start to enter into those really cold, wet conditions of July and early August. So although Briobia mites are present and causing some grief at the moment, and certainly we are aware that the chemicals have been required to combat the, the presence of Briobia mites in emerging crops, um, do keep in mind that over the next month or so, they will naturally decline anyway due to environmental conditions. In terms of the impact that these mites have, um, again, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with um, the damage caused by red-legged earth mites and perhaps some of these other mites. It's typically observed as silvering of the leaves. In the case of Briobia mites, they cause white trails or stippling. In the case of Balastia mites, they can cause cupping and distortion of cotyledons, particularly to pulse crops like lupins. And of course, all four of these pest mites can cause seedling death. And I guess that's why we are, I guess, concerned at times about high mite populations, particularly during that crop establishment phase. So they certainly can be quite damaging when they reach high population sizes. In terms of management for not just mites, but I guess for all insect and invertebrate pests, we, we typically like to consider um, three different pillars of pest management, biological control, cultural control, and chemical control. And so in terms of our mites, if we start with our biological control, there are predatory mites that um, will certainly attack things like red-legged earth mites and blue oak mites. And these are other mites, but in this case, they're not plant feeding, they're predatory. They're much bigger, they're brightly coloured, um, and they're very active. Some of these species have been imported overseas specifically for biocontrol of some of our earth mite pests. However, unfortunately, in pulse crops um, currently, with, I guess, the inputs that we put into those, uh, those systems, we typically don't find a large number of predatory mites around, certainly not at the, the level where we expect to see uh, strong biological control. So while I'd certainly encourage you to consider these predatory mites, I certainly would not um, uh, recommend relying on them um, to combat um, high or even medium pest densities of earth mites. In terms of cultural control strategies, there are a few things that we can do when it comes to mite control. Um, one of the, the key ones is to consider controlling broadleaf weeds which we know are a place where mites harbour and also where they reproduce. So they're great breeding grounds for our pest mites. So if we can control these weeds, particularly around fence lines, it can be an effective way of minimising the build-up of those pest populations. We also know that pulse crops vary quite a bit in their susceptibility to mites. So things like vetches, uh, lupins, field peas and even faba beans are quite susceptible to earth mite attack. However, we've got crops like chickpeas and lentils, which are a lot more tolerant. So we certainly can consider crop rotations if that is practical. Um, and I guess one example that I've put here is that if we're coming out of a pasture phase where we know mite uh, populations to be high, um, we may consider putting in a more tolerant crop like chickpeas or lentils over a more susceptible crop, like for example, field peas. In terms of chemical options for, for mites, 
for all four of these pest groups, we do have insecticides that are registered for their control. However, do keep in mind that the label rates will differ depending on species. The reason that they differ is because these species differ um, quite a bit in how they respond to chemicals. So species like Barovia mites, species like Bolaustia mites, are quite tolerant to a number of different chemistries and chemical products that we use to control things like red-legged earth mites. And so for these reasons, we have fewer options. Um, and when we do have chemical options for these species, we typically need to apply higher rates. So again, it's really important to get that identification right before deciding what the most appropriate management option will be. Also, if applying chemicals, um, it is certainly worthwhile with species like mites to consider border sprays. We often find the mites are invading uh, crops and emerging seedlings from paddock edges, from fence lines, and often we can get away with just a border spray rather than playing a, a spraying a chemical across the entire paddock. The reason I'm advocating for this is twofold. One, it will preserve the beneficial insects and mites that are in that paddock, not just those that attack the earth mites, but also those that attack other crop pests. The second reason, um, of course, is because it will reduce the selection pressure for insecticide resistance. And I'll talk a little bit today about insecticide resistance and why that is important. Because Briavia mites uh, are quite prevalent at the moment in a lot of areas, um, I do want to just make the point that we do have a complexity of species with Briavia mites. We're not just dealing with a single species. And I suspect that what we have is species that do differ in their response to chemistries. And the reason I say this is because we often get quite unpredictable and variable results, particularly when growers are applying pyrethroid chemicals, so things like Fastac and Telstar, to control Briobia mites. So as a general rule of thumb, we would generally advise that it is more reliable to apply phosphates to control Briobia mites than synthetic pyrethroids. That's certainly not to say that in some cases the pyrethroids won't work, uh, but we certainly uh, know that there are many chemical control phases that can occur when dealing with that particular mite pest. Now, in terms of chemical controls, I do just want to focus a little bit on red-legged earth mites just briefly. And the reason I want to do this is because they are different in one key aspect, and that is that they have evolved insecticide resistance. So insecticide resistance was first discovered a bit over a decade ago in Western Australia um, in red-legged earth mites. And quite recently in the southern region, we have also identified insecticide resistance in a few red-legged earth mite populations. This map here that you can see on your screen is, I guess, just one way to represent some insecticide resistance surveillance work that we've done within our group uh, through a GRDC funded project. The green circles essentially represent red-legged earth mite populations that we have collected and screened for insecticide resistance, in this case to organophosphates, so products like lemats and chlorpyrifos. The red circles indicate populations that we've collected and screened and we've found to be resistance. Uh, so you can see that we have resistance in South Australia to organophosphates in red-legged earth mites. And this second map is uh, a similar story, except in this instance, we're looking at pyrethroid resistance, so products like Fastac and Telstar. Uh, and again, you can see a number of red populations in South Australia representing insecticide resistance in those regions. So at the moment, it is still reasonably isolated, but um, unequivocally, we know that this resistance will spread. Uh, we will have resistance pop up in Victoria sooner or later. And certainly um, sooner or later, we will also find resistance, I'm sure, in southern New South Wales as well. So this is certainly something to keep an eye on and certainly something to consider when um, thinking about managing mites, not just in pulse crops, but in other broadacre crops and pastures. So in terms of red-legged earth mites, we would advocate um, considering uh, what a resistance management strategy might look like uh, for that particular pest. And one of the key uh, principles to any good resistance management strategy, whether it be for an insect or a weed or a pathogen, is to avoid the repeated applications of chemicals from the same mode of action group. So by that I mean not using, for example, synthetic pyrethroids successively uh, 
in the same paddock. We really want to be mixing our chemical options. That is a great way to minimise selection pressure for resistance evolution. If you want to read some more, there is a great little resistance management strategy that's available free on the GRDC website. Um, this provides some practical but science-based recommendations that will allow growers to get uh, effective control of red-legged earth mites, but in a way that will not select for uh, additional resistance to pyrethroids and agonophosphates. And so I certainly would encourage you to, to, to go to the GRDC website and download that document. If we now turn our attention to aphids, uh, like the mites, there are a number of different species that we commonly find in pulse crops in Southern Australia. The four that we mostly, I guess, are, are drawn towards and we focus on are the green peach aphid, the cow pea, the blue green and the pea aphid. Just briefly, the biology and life cycle. Within Australia, most aphids reproduce asexually or certainly uh, reproduce asexually most of the time. And what this allows the aphids to do is to give birth to live young. And it's interesting to note that those live young are already pregnant with the next generation. And what this means is that in theory, uh, an aphid outbreak or an aphid population in a paddock can start from a single individual that flies in and lands on a particular host plant. That one individual can give rise to an entire population. It also means because of this very uh, rapid ability to reproduce that aphid populations can build up very quickly from a low number to a very high number in a fairly short space of time under the right environmental conditions. With aphids, we, we find two different distinct forms, a wingless and a winged form. And they can look a little bit different from a diagnostics perspective. The winged forms are the individuals that we often uh, are drawn towards in terms of from a research, but also from a pest management perspective, because these are the individuals that are flying around and infesting uh, new paddocks, particularly during that uh, early crop establishment phase. Unlike uh, many of the mites that we've already touched on. Uh, aphids are present all year round. However, they do have two peak periods. They are typically most abundant in autumn and spring in the, in the southern region. However, they will persist in summer and in winter, but certainly they do not like the very warm, dry conditions of summer, and they do not like the very cold, wet conditions of winter. So they typically are not reproducing quickly during those periods but they still will be present in our cropping landscape, just in very low abundances. This graph here is from some very old data um, conducted in the 50s and 60s, but it's still very relevant and, and, and actually very good data. Basically what it does, it, it illustrates in this case for green peach aphids at three different locations in Victoria, when the aphids are typically flying around the landscape. And you can see two distinct periods one in early autumn and one in the sort of tail end of spring. And this is typically what we expect to see with uh, not just green peach aphids, but a lot of other crop aphids in the southern region. These two distinct times of year when aphids are mostly flying about. And this of course is quite important when considering um, how we manage these species, but also how we might conduct risk assessments for not just the aphids, but also for viruses that they're transmitting. So what are the impacts that aphids can have in pulse crops? Well, of course, they can cause direct feeding damage um, and that can occur in autumn and in spring. Unless pulse crops are, are stressed, for example, moisture stressed, most years we don't tend to see significant feeding damage in autumn just because the aphid numbers aren't large enough. Uh, we certainly can in spring because that's the, typically the period when aphid numbers are at their greatest. But of course, most of the attention, most of our concern in terms of pulse aphids is really through the viruses that they transmit. And of course, with most viruses, it's the early infestations or the early infections that are most damaging and that cause most yield loss. Certainly today, I'm not going to go through all the different viruses that we uh, potentially know that, that aphids transmit in pulse crops. Certainly, I would encourage you to be uh, somewhat familiar with, I guess, the higher risk viruses in your region. And certainly, I would consider understanding from there, which are the aphids that transmit those viruses, because it does differ. And also to try to understand whether those viruses are persistent or non-persistent. 
and I'll come back to this point in a moment. In terms of management for aphids, the first thing that I want to talk about is the biological control. So unlike the story I guess I conveyed with the mites, with aphids, not just in pulse crops, but other crops as well, we have a really great resource of natural enemies, of beneficial insects uh, and other invertebrates that exist in our cropping systems that exert very, very good control of aphids. Um, typically, and a lot of time, this control is going on unnoticed um, and probably unrecognised. And so I certainly would re recommend becoming much more familiar with the beneficials that attack our crop aphids and certainly considering them as part of an overall pest management practice. They can be very, very important, often resulting in complete population crashes of aphids. That is certainly not uncommon. This is a little video here of what's called a hoverfly larvae, uh, capturing a pea aphid and devouring it uh, in only a matter of seconds. So these things are really voracious uh, feeders and can um, wipe out aphids quite quickly. Also with uh, pulse aphids, there are a number of different cultural control strategies, two that are particularly, uh, I think, beneficial, uh, controlling the green bridge. This should be done at least a couple of weeks prior to sowing pulse crops. And the second where practical is to sow pulse crops into standing stubble. This practice uh, deters aphids from landing in that particular paddock and potentially bringing in unwanted viruses. So two very effective cultural control strategies that can be used. In terms of chemical control options for aphids, um, as I mentioned earlier, I guess often the chemicals that we're using are targeted towards the aphids because we're concerned about the viruses that they might be transmitting, not necessarily the direct feeding damage. And we know that the viruses that can be transmitted in pulse crops are either persistently or non-persistently transmitted. And that depends on the type of virus. So basically, uh, you know, I guess very sort of high level, non-persistent viruses means that the aphids do not need to feed for very long on a plant to infect that plant with the virus, nor to acquire the virus if they're feeding on an infected plant. And what that means from a management perspective is that insecticides are often not fast enough to reduce that transmission of the virus happening because it can happen in only a matter of seconds before the, the aphids are actually controlled by the chemical. However, there are persistent viruses and, and a common one that most people will be aware of is beet western yellows virus or commonly known now as turnip yellows virus. This is a persistent virus and in this instance that virus the aphids need to feed for quite an extended period of time for them to actually acquire the virus. Um, some estimates are several hours. So in this instance, for these viruses, insecticides can certainly reduce the transmission. Uh, and that's certainly something to, to keep in mind when considering seed treatments, but also uh, when considering foliar spray applications. So I guess my, my take home for, for crop aphids, if chemical spraying is warranted, I would certainly advocate that we consider using selective chemistries. So things like pyrimacarb um, is a great example because they do preserve the beneficials. And we know that these beneficials are quite important to overall uh, crop management. It would be remiss of me not to just briefly talk about green peach aphids. Um, along a similar lines to the red-legged earth mites, green peach aphids are quite unique in they have a high propensity to develop insecticide resistance. Uh, we've been working on this species for, for a number of years um, and we know that insecticide resistance in green peach aphids is widespread. We have resistance to pyrethroid chemicals, to organophosphates, to carbamates, and also more recently to neonicotinoids. And um, as part of our insecticide surveillance work, again, that we've been doing with GRDC, uh, right across, across Australia, we find that these resistances are incredibly widespread. So all of these red circles on this map indicate where we've detected resistance to synthetic pyrethroids. The green circles are populations where we haven't found resistance. This map would look almost identical if we looked at organophosphates, carbamates, nanicotinoids. Almost all populations in cropping systems of green peach aphids are resistant to each of these chemistries. 
Also, uh, very, very recently, we have just detected uh, the first signs of sensitivity shifts to transform in some isolated populations of green peach aphids in Western Australia. And this was certainly quite concerning. Uh, this is not good news, and it certainly um, should be used as a warning of why we need to use chemistries very selectively um, when we're controlling species like green peach aphids that just have this ability to evolve resistance uh, quite readily. And so again, you know, I would encourage uh, growers and advisors to think carefully about resistance management for green peach aphids. Um, one of the, the key things, first and foremost, is to assess aphid and beneficial populations to firstly determine whether we need a chemical in the first place. And if we do need that chemistry, um, the same principle applies as with red-legged earth mites. What we don't want to be doing is using uh, chemistry successively on that same uh, green peach aphid population. We need to be rotating uh, modes of action wherever possible. And again, there is a resistance management strategy that is available on the GRDC website. So um, I would encourage you to have a look at that. And in light of our recent uh, findings on Transform, I think it's really pertinent that we do um, encourage people to, to take a look at this resistance management strategy for green peach aphids because we are quickly running out of chemical options. Finally, and just briefly, I want to talk about native budworm, Halicoverpa punctigera. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Helicoverpa in pulse crops. Obviously, it's a spring pest. Um, the, the caterpillar, of course, is the damaging life stage. Uh, as you can see in this photo, uh, these caterpillars feed on the fruiting parts and seeds of pulse crops. Um, and also, depending on the conditions and the season, the small larvae can enter into emerging pulse pods. And once they've done so, they can be quite damaging to the developing seed inside those pods. Monitoring is, is really key when thinking about native budworm management. Uh, we typically uh, monitor through two means. The first is pheromone trapping, um, and we use these pheromone traps to give us an insight into when moths are flying in from inland Australia and landing in our cropping systems. And so these can be quite informative of trying to, uh, I guess, identify when is the, the right time to get out into the crop with a sweep net or a beat sheet um, to start uh, monitoring for the larvae. And of course, the, the sweep netting and the beach sheeting is much more informative and accurate in terms of understanding the risk of pulse crops to native budworm larvae. In terms of management for native budworm, um, well, we also have, like the aphids, we also have a whole suite of natural enemies that exist in cropping systems um, that are prevalent in pulse crops. There are a number of different beneficials that attack both the eggs and the larvae. And there are also some naturally occurring diseases and viruses that attack the larvae. And in some years, they can be very, very effective. Um, but really, we can't, uh, I guess, control or really plan for, for many of those diseases. In terms of chemical controls, um, fortunately for a species like native budworm, there's been a hell of a lot of research. And so we do have some quite good economic thresholds that are available. And these thresholds, um, I guess, guide us as to when it is economically viable to put out an insecticide spray. So there's some good thresholds available on the QDAF website and also on the WADPIRD website. Um, if you haven't seen those before, I'd certainly encourage you to take a look at them. And also, you know, with native budworm, there are now some, some newer selective chemistries that are available. Um, these are more expensive, certainly, but they do preserve the beneficials. And certainly if we have years where native budworm are coming in early and sprays are warranted early in the season, I'd certainly encourage you to consider those selective chemistries because they preserve the beneficials and will um, subsequently reduce the risk of having to go back and spray the paddock again uh, three to four weeks later. So that brings me towards the end, just uh, I guess a, a few acknowledgements of people here at Caesar and uh, elsewhere in terms of uh, project collaborators. And of course today I, I really haven't touched on a number of other pulse pests that of course are very important, things like ETL and, and pea weevil, uh, two probably that, that immediately jump out. But we do have some great information on our website. If, uh, if you are interested, you can Google for Pest Notes Southern. We have a whole bunch of information sheets on a whole range of crop pests, 
Um, and for those that are interested in the PestFact service, um, there's some contact details there. It's a free service available to growers and advisors uh, funded by GRDC. And as part of that, as I said up front, we do offer um, identifications for, for growers and advisors. So I'll leave it there, Prue, and, and happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Paul. So just a reminder, if you do want to ask Paul a question, you can either type something into the Q&A box now or put your hand up. Uh, Paul, what might we expect from native budworm in pulse crops this spring? Um, this spring, well, look, um, so native budworm, uh, basically, for those that aren't aware, I guess, breed up in inland Australia. Um, so these are, are a migratory pest. And um, so what that means is that the moths build up in, in inland uh, Australia and they fly down typically in August or September. And so really the, the, the peak flights or the number of individuals that fly down are very much dependent on the inland conditions that have occurred through autumn and, and winter. Typically, um, I guess we can make some predictions based on that. And I guess what we know at the moment is that there hasn't been a great, um, I guess, amount of rainfall in those inland areas. There's been a small bit in perhaps parts of northern South Australia. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't say that we're heading for a high risk uh, year for native budworm. Um, I would say that we're probably more on the low to medium uh, end in terms of uh, budworm flights happening in spring based on their breeding grounds. Excellent. And we're still, still a bit quiet on the question side, so I've got another one. Uh, what does the discovery of sensitivity shifts to transform in Western Australian green peach aphid mean for us over here in the south? Uh, well, look, I mean, it's a little bit hard to, to know. Um, certainly what we've seen in the past with green peach aphids, uh, for example, when we first identified resistance to carbamate, so things like pyramore, um, that was also first detected in Western Australia. And it only took a few years before that resistance uh, found its way across to Eastern Australia um, and also right up to Queensland. So we know green peach aphids can move around um, very, very readily, not just from, I guess, region to region, but really, I guess, almost on a national level. So the resistance that we've, we've found there, that, that very sort of low level resistance could certainly spread um, but we still are very much in the early days of this discovery. We don't know um, with whether this resistance will, uh, I guess, persist in the longer term. We are doing all we can to encourage people to reduce their reliance on sulfoxiflor in those regions. Um, we hope that, you know, we can really drive down that sensitivity shift. Um, and if there are fitness costs, that that sensitivity shift will potentially abate. Um, so we don't know, um, but it certainly is, a, I guess, a pretty important reminder of what we need to do, regardless of whether we're in WA or in South Australia or, or Victoria, New South Wales. We certainly need to use that product very judiciously. We don't want to be um, using repeated applications of Transform um, when targeting green peach aphids because we just know, and this is evidence to, to demonstrate, that uh, the green peach aphids can adapt very, very quickly and can evolve resistance uh, very, very readily. And we've seen that locally, we've seen that internationally uh, as well. Thanks, Paul. We've uh, had no more questions come in and we're almost out of time. So we'll bring today's webinar to a close. A great big thank you to Paul and to all of you for participating. Uh, just to let you know, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project will have a number of activities occurring throughout this year um, and we'll continue to bring you the latest in pulse information. We've got a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for new pulse growers and their advisors. So if you're near one of the locations on your screen and would like to get involved, send me an email and I'll get you in touch with the relevant coordinator. We'll be also be having some crop walks at Southern Pulse Agronomy trial sites right across the region in late winter and spring. And we're going to be running a webinar series monthly throughout the growing season. So similar to what you've heard today, we'll be holding another one. The next one in July will be on diseases. So please keep an eye out on GRDC social media or BCG social media or email myself if you'd like to be kept in the loop for upcoming webinars.
Um, if you have any other suggestions or requests for things you'd like to learn about pulses this year, please drop me a line anytime and we'll see what we can organise for you. Also, once you drop out of this webinar, you'll see on, in your internet browser a link to a very short survey, Monkey Survey, that will take you less than a minute to complete and will just give us some evaluation on how you found the technology and today's webinar. Thanks again, everyone, for your time today, and I hope you all grow some great pest-free pulse crops this season.